Last one.
<clears throat> Hi, I'm Guy Dias. I'm the production designer on the X-Men 2. Designing and uh, building the sets, uh, overseeing the costumes, uh, overseeing the character design, and uh, all the graphics and gadgets that you see throughout the course of the film, uh, including a lot of the initial uh, storyboarding phase, which I work with closely with the director. When you start designing a film like this, uh, which is obviously a sequel, you have to pay some respect to the designs that have gone before. <coughs> Obviously, in the first film, it would be sort of foolish to deviate from that. It's, it's, it's. I think it's, it's a good move to, uh, to, not have that jump in terms of design. So, a lot of the sets that we saw in the first film that reappear are built almost identically. There is an opportunity, however, because of the script and the way it enlarges the world of the X Men. A lot more uh, places in this film. You can take what was sort of laid down as the foundations and then sort of expand upon it. We're here today at the X Mansion set at Vancouver Studios, uh, which is a sort of a recreation of um, the location of Royal Roads where we shot a lot of the scenes. Okay. You miss me, kid? Not really. Hmm. How are you doing? Okay, how are you? A lot of the scenes involve stunts, breakaway walls, secret passages, and things that don't really exist in the architecture. And so uh, it's necessary to almost create an extension of the existing house uh, in which to facilitate all these needs. Uh, this is the main stretch of the corridor. At the moment, it's dressed as an upstairs corridor, so we have the blue carpet. Uh, to simulate what we have at Royal Roads, we've actually got an inlay of wood here, which is actually printed. This is not real wood. We stop the real wood from here, and this just becomes a printed facade. It would take way too long to create all this in reality, so uh, it works for a quick read on the camera. Um, the wood uh, is all painted. Uh, none of this uh, uh, varnishing is, is real. It's all painted to match with Royal Roads so that we don't get a jump as we change from location to uh, the set. Um, basically, there are two or three things that happen here. We have uh, a sequence of events where uh, the children are surprised in their beds and attacked and uh, <coughs> need to escape. So built into the set, we have a number of secret passages. There's one hidden here for, uh, uh, for an escape scene. So in here, it's a little bit dark, but you can see We've dressed the inside of this uh, with uh, um, bricks, and actually this is foam uh, that uh, represents the mortar. And this escape route takes some of the kids out of the mansion. And down at this end where they're currently shooting, we have um, a stunt wall that's been taped off in green, and that's actually where um, somebody's going, or a couple of guys actually going to come flying through that wall. Three, two, one, go. Okay. Uh, well done, kids. Now we're just going to walk outside of the set and see uh, where we are in reality. Uh, this is one of the stages for the Vancouver Film Studios. This production is much, much bigger than the first one. I guess uh, somebody was telling me here in Vancouver that we're technically the biggest build in, in the history of the town. In terms of comparing it, the design improvements uh, in this film, I, I'm a great admirer of uh, the designer who worked on the first film and really respectful of his work and uh, it was extremely uh, challenging to even sort of uh, try and approach it from a, a standpoint of are we going to do better, but in a way you have to. I think. The audience is expecting a higher level of, of detail, uh, more 
an in-depth look into the X-Men's world. In the film, there's a museum set which we uh, had to create, and uh, initially I started scouting some local uh, museums and exhibition spaces here in Vancouver, but of course they weren't quite what Brian needed for his script, which was a science museum. There wasn't really anything along the lines of what he required. Originally when we came to this space, um, I was trying to show Brian a smaller area uh, and suggesting that that could be entirely a mutant exhibit. And he sort of waltzed out into this big space and said, oh, this is the museum. And, oh, God, what am I going to do? This was a, 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 a huge set decorating job. Uh, everything <coughs> here from uh, the <coughs> panels that you see, uh, the color scheme of the museum, and a lot of the exhibits have all been handmade uh, for this scene. The exhibits, a lot of them were created by us in the art department. A lot of them were shipped in from Japan and Europe and the United States. So basically a huge collection of, of artifacts from all over the world, leaving me the task of basically tying it all together with the museum graphics, which I chose sort of very strong red and yellow motifs so that played nicely off the blue that we see throughout the film. A lot of the large dinosaur bones are here on loan from private collectors or smaller museums. Those dinosaur bones that are actually cast from real dinosaurs, that therefore we uh, reduce the risk of, uh, of things happening to, to important artifacts. The idea of getting a woolly mammoth was just fantastic, you know, and, uh, and then when I told Brian, Brian, I'm gonna get this woolly mammoth, he said, oh, what else can you get? Can you get me a saber-toothed tiger? So I'll try, can you get me a Tyrannosaurus rex? So I'll try. So it sort of went on like that, and we have, you yeah, know, we have quite a few, I think, dinosaurs here because of that. So you just can't beat the flexibility of taking a huge space like this that has nothing in it, and then just doing exactly what you want. Something would always be wrong with one of the museums. The, whether it was personal choices of mine, I didn't like the color of the, the pink carpet, or, or whether it was something that wasn't working for Brian, the architecture was too old perhaps for the scene. Um, this obviously was a winner because the architecture is basically made up of giant exits, so you sort of have that subliminal context as well going on, which is nice. The core of the point of the scene was the mutant exhibit, which is a series of uh, 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 metal frames that, that hold graphic panels explaining all about mutation in a very sort of fictional way uh, in order really to sort of frighten the children. But the larger uh, sort of context of this set in the films really the, the realization that the mutant children have from the mansion that they are not accepted in society. They are sort of outcasts and no matter how hard the teachers try to bring them back into society there's always these nasty little reminders that they're not actually wanted. It's mind-boggling how many sets we have, and every two minutes you're in a new environment, you know, you're finding out a lot more about the individual characters, their personal journeys, you know, they take you just about everywhere you can possibly imagine. So this is Magneto's plastic prison. And uh, this is where um, he remains for the first part of the film. Uh, the set is about 20 square feet. It's not very big at all. And uh, to accommodate a shooting crew on a set like this that's so small, uh, we usually have a platform that bucks up against one of the sides of the plastic prison. And we actually remove one of the walls, what we call wildly. Uh, that means that the camera can be on the outside of the, sh the set, shooting inwards, and give us the impression that we're still inside the set. Um, there are a number of props and pieces of furniture here uh, to sort of s help sell the idea that we really are in a plastic world. Uh, here's the famous uh, plastic wheelchair that Xavier uses once he visits. Uh, the chess set, uh, which was uh, handmade, uh, which is a major feature in the film. Uh, the bed, and then the desk and some of the, the small things that we found around that are basically made of plastic to help sell the idea. Remembering not, not an ounce of metal can really exist in here. Uh, one of the new favorite features of our director, Brian Singer, is are the, uh, well that one's gone, but one's over there, are the, um, the cameras, the uh, fiber optic cameras, which are made entirely of plastic. And we had to expand upon the world of the plastic prison and 
that uh, a lot of what was created in CG the first time around, we actually had to build this time. For example, the drawbridge and uh, the reception area. So here we are in the metal detection area, and uh, actually the first unit uh, of photography has just left yesterday, and the set's in quite a state, it's held up quite well. Uh, you can see on the floor there's a lot of tape where uh, we, uh, the actors basically had their marks for some of the action sequences, a lot of scuff marks. Um, each one of these hexagonal tiles is individually stuck down with glue, um, and uh, as you can see we've got some missing here now, uh, which will all have to be repaired for the second unit that will come in in a few days' time. Um, but uh, uh, it's held up pretty well, I think. What's interesting about this set was I probably never would have used these tiles had I known they were going to do action sequences in here. Originally, in the first script, it was uh, supposed to be um, Xavier with Scott wheeling up and visiting for a conversation. There was never any sort of fight in here. And I guess in one of the, the script rewrites, they suddenly wrote in this action sequence. But um, it seems to have worked out quite well. The Nightcrawler's Church is a real church that we're uh, able to use. And uh, we're going to have to basically uh, dress it as though it's um, being renovated. So it's sort of an abandoned church, so to speak. A lot of scaffolding and dust cloths and spooky statues. And it has a a very sort of uh, uh, almost tongue-in-cheek hammer horror feel to it, you know, it has that sort of gothic feel to it to introduce where Nightcrawler hides out. We're here on the set of the White House and we're currently in the Oval Office and uh, look around, I'll point out some of the details of this particular set. Over here we have a replica of the presidential desk uh, which has actually been handmade for the show and uh, somebody who worked uh, away on this for two months solid. It's a really beautiful job, perfect replica. Um, it's actually raised, as you can see, on, on dollies currently so that we can move it around in and out of the camera shots as necessary. It's incredibly heavy. Um, underneath my feet here, we're standing actually on the, uh, the new Oval Office carpet, uh, which has replaced the royal blue version, which. Uh, uh, changed out by Bush. Um, if you look up, you can see we actually don't have a ceiling in the Oval Office. This was a requirement for the stunt crew who will be coming here and doing some amazing things with Nightcrawler. And uh, the design of this, uh, this set is, is pretty authentic. We're about uh, two square feet larger in size to accommodate some of the, the, uh, the crew. There's a lot of people that need to cram in this room. Um, and uh, you'll notice uh, that some of the mouldings we have, which was pointed out to be, we have an X up here, which uh, actually does exist in the real White House, as strange as that may seem. Um, and uh, all the upholstery on the seats is uh, custom made and was uh, uh, ordered from the same companies who re upholstered the, uh, the Oval Office furnishings. And uh, yeah, that's just about it for this set. So uh, we're here in the, uh, the White House lower corridor, uh, which is the famous uh, marble corridor. And uh, this is a replica of that. And uh, we're able to recreate a lot of the art um, basically by printing uh, co uh, copies of the paintings. And then we treat the surface of the, uh, the, the printed uh, paper with a lacquer uh, that sort of gives it a, a, an oil paint finish. And that's, uh, that illusion is created. Um, all the marble in here obviously is, is uh, basically wood that's been painted. Uh, there's quite a lot of it. Um, and uh, the hall at present we sort of dedicate it to the First Ladies. Um, they do have a collection of art at the White House that rotates and we figured it would be nice to do that. Hello, my name's Bob Snow. I was hired as a technical, one of the technical advisors on the movie. I deal with the White House and the Secret Service aspect. The, uh, what they've created here is a, a replica of the White House entrance area, and they have made the photographs, which I'm always amazed that they could make a, a photograph look like a painting and reproduce it this way. They make it look so much like the real thing. <coughs> the grand hallway here that they have uh, reproduced 
gives you the feeling that uh, you're actually in the White House. The, the columns and the chandeliers and the paintings that they have made all are uh, quite, uh, quite authentic looking. The, uh, actually, some of the expansiveness of the White House that they have built is a little bit larger than uh, the actual White House. The west wing of the White House is really relatively small, all corners and hallways. But because of the camera movement and other necessities that you have on a movie, they made it just a little bit larger. As I mentioned before, many people uh, question sometimes when they see one of the movies that do such a good job in an Oval Office whether or not the cameras have actually gone into the White House, which they haven't. It's really the talent of the uh, carpenters and the set dressers and everybody else that makes it look the way it is. Stryker's base, which is under a dam at uh, uh, the Alkali Lake, is, is the biggest set that we have. It was far too big to put on any of the stages here in, in the Vancouver Film Studio. So uh, we actually found a disused storage facility. Uh, it's colossal, it's uh, 200 feet by 600 feet or something. And um, our base uh, uh, covers at least half of that area. It's pretty interesting, a lot of uh, dark and dingy corridors. There's a control room the famous augmentation room where Wolverine was uh, supposed to have been, you know, augmented and changed and had adamantium put into his, his bone marrow. There's also uh, a huge spillway tunnel, uh, which is uh, pretty impressive, and some giant doors which open up onto a sort of a, um, I guess you could say, a containment room where Stryker keeps some of his hardware and, uh, and vehicles. Jet was something we had to revisit as in the first film it was touched upon in this film it plays a much bigger part it's uh, probably a cross between a, an f-16 and a stealth it's about uh, it's about uh, 85 feet long and uh, sort of has three compartments to it a changing area for the x-men a, a sort of a rear cargo hold area um, and then the front cockpit area. Brian is very demanding. He, he works hard and expects the best from all his crew, and uh, that's what we we do. And uh, it is hard work, but you you know when the when the set's there in front of you and they're about to start shooting, you take a sort of a, a sigh of relief. That's one more down. You're very happy with it, and then you you know you go on to the next one. And hope that turns out just as well. One more. My name is Louise Mingenbach, and I am the costume designer of this X-Men, as well as the last. And um, I've worked with Brian Singer on all his films, and um, so mm -hmm. we're still together, which is great. Um, basically, when we started this film, he asked me, um, to make it look the same because a lot of them were repeat characters but but different you know he wanted it all to kind of become more special so we have some repeat characters I mean there's Rogue who uh, of course Anna Paquin and in the first she was this runaway and a very bundled up and lost little soul now she's evolved and you know this beauty so instead of the green coat which is her signature piece in X-Men 1 we gave her a really super groovy, sexy little thing in X2. And, um, you know, unfortunately, she's not going to be able to be in it for too much of the film, but, but she'll look smashing when she's in it. But what was really fun about this is we, got, we were working all these X's, you know? I don't know if anyone's going to notice them, but let us, but we think it's fun. So here's her X across her, across her chest. We also have um, Storm, of course, Halle Berry's back, as well as um, Fonka Johnson, Jean Grey. And um, in the first, we did all sorts of uh, ethnic pieces on, on Halle. And in this, we're continuing to do that, but we were mixing it up a lot. So she's got this beautiful bag that is, uh, you know, a, a 19th century American Indian piece. And she's wearing it with a Chinese belt and sort of a hodgepodge kind of ethnic -y, beautiful little jacket. She pulled that all off very well. Jean Grey, who is Phoenix in the comic book. 
um, we had the, we had the prep this time to get to make her this amazing jewelry. So we made, as an homage to the comic book, um, pieces of jewelry that are Phoenix Rising, and we made this coat for her that unfortunately isn't hanging here because it's still we we're still working on it with a huge embroidered Phoenix Rising up the back, and hopefully we'll get a shot of that in the film. You never know, but. It's hard. Sometimes they don't really focus on the back, but it would be great if we could see it. And I know that all the X-Men fans would say, we know that. That's, that's Jean Grey, Phoenix Rising. So we made her some beautiful jewelry as well, which is, you know, which we designed. And there's the Phoenix, you know, coming out of the flames. And she wears that with all the costume changes. It's very pretty. And we made her um, a fun X-Men, you know, Tiffany, but it's not better, X-Men. Uh, bracelet. And then at the forest clearing, this isn't so subtle, but I think it's really great. We made all the girls these, a scene in the forest clearing, these um, sterling silver belt buckles, which are fabulous. Excellent. I think they're very chic. One of our new characters is Nightcrawler, played by Alan Cummings, and um, we're working on, on his stuff. It's a lot of prosthetics and a lot of uh, pants that need to fit over tails and is a, lot, a little bit more complicated than just dressing beautiful women. It, it's limiting, you know, working uh, around prosthetics because you have to hide certain lines and you have to get around certain weird shapes that are, nobody can see or, or the, the vision is gone, you know? You're, you know, you have, to, you have to hide it all and make them believe. I just thought it would be fun if we tried to splatter some paint on the leather, just instead of having a black coat, which we've seen a black leather coat, obviously, it's, it's a lot on, on film. And, uh, so I thought, well, maybe if we just splatter, if we could have, you know, a painter splatter some, some crazy shiny paint on it, maybe it'd be special. And then we screen tested it, and it was. I mean, I think it looks amazing on film, and Brian seems very pleased. So I think we're, it's going to make it into the film. Our other new big character is Lady Deathstrike. Kelly Hill is playing her. She has worn this coat. This is sort of based on sort of a corseted thing. It's sort of a, a little glimpse into who she becomes back at Stryker's Lair, which is something much crazier and much more uh, extreme. But um, here in this scene, when she wears this, she's at the White House. And I, I, I pushed it as far as I think you can push a, a, a jacket that somebody would wear to the White House. I mean, it's practically corseted, but. I think maybe, maybe, you know, if you're a really sexy girl, maybe you would, you, you know, you would wear this. I don't think it's too far, but it is, it's extreme. What, what the, Brian's request was, was to make everything same but different. We redesigned Magneto's helmet, gave him a few more details. So that's happening. This wasn't quite what the first one was, same but different. Um, and his costume is back. Um, again similar to this but hopefully for his own comfort it'll be easier to get on and off that was a huge um huge uh, i think inconvenience for him the first time around there were many straps holding all that thing on and, and uh, it took him a half an hour or more to just get in and out of his cape so i think he'll be happier this time we were able to fix that the cyclops same but different um he streamlined glasses you know things that i think um, everyone felt were, they were too big and too cumbersome in the first one, so they've been reworked and they're beautiful. And, um, of course his character is, is he's sort of this stodgy Scott, you know, so again, he's stodgy Scott in this one. Of course there's Wolverine, and that's same but different as well. We redesigned his cool leather jacket, giving it a little, little bit more detail, a little bit more, you know, flair. And, you know, I mean, dressing Hugh is is a lucky thing for a girl, right? He's, he's, he's great looking and, and, and lovely. So, um, but you know, in classic Wolverine style, he doesn't change, he is who he is. And that's, um, he's not a fashion plate. Xavier is, uh, you know, Xavier is, a, is fancy pants and he's got beautiful suits we had made for him, tailor made, all custom. Of course, very, in, this is an interesting little thing about him because he sits down through the whole film. We had to cut his suits to accommodate you know, to, to cut them lower. We had to cut the pants down, we had to cut the jack, uh, the vest up. It, so he looks less rumpled when he's uh, seated through the whole film. Uh, 
But when he stands up to go to the craft service table, he's got these pants that are cut down here. And his poor little vest, is, he just, it's lost, you know, it's the illusion is, but he looks great, see. So those are the, you know, unfortunately, you know, he said to me on the first one, he said, Louise, I'd love to take some of these suits home, but I mean, they, I don't, you know, they're not going to work in, in my real life. Unfortunately, they won't because they are very beautiful. But the Iceman is back, Bobby. Drake and now there's Pyro mm. and Jubilee has been kind of fleshed out in this in this um, number two uh, and they're fun to dress but um, unfortunately for me so this movie takes place in, in so few days two or three days and the attack on the X mansion happens at night and they get stuck in their damn pajamas you know most of the film so so that um, it could have been more fun if they you know had been attacked at dinner time. Everything, I should say, for the principles has been manufactured. You know, we have um, everything you see here, plus all the jewelry has been um, made specifically for the film, um, down to jeans and 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 uh, pants and shoes, in fact, for the leads and for Magneto and things like that. The the kids, on the other hand, are are more uh, ready to wear off the rack. I think it's a big mistake to make it look too dated, and it will look dated in five years. This film, if it's if it if you if you deal strictly with the fashions of the times, so um, I try and uh, do a little bit of everything, you know, and mix it up so that there is no there's no t t time period. I mean, certainly there's time references, historical references, but but not fashion references, hopefully that are too um, of the moment because that's always a mistake for a movie like this. Then it doesn't say anything and it doesn't stick X-Men 2 in a you know, pigeonhole it. It just becomes a timeless classic movie as well. <laughs>